So I started this work when I was in Cambridge doing my postdoc, and then I'm continuing now as my own individual fellowship. And my background, I come from politics background, and I do a lot of anthropological, ethnographic research, and I publish it in geography journals because I find geography as a discipline most open to interdisciplinary research. Um, and in the time that I have today, I would like to talk about the most recent strand of my ongoing work on the politics, everyday politics of mega infrastructures in Kenya. And this focuses on global histories of coloniality that are currently being reworked through mega infrastructure development. And as critical scholarship has argued, including Theo, infrastructure, mega infrastructure is the latest trope of progress in the long history of development interventions in Africa, as well as the so-called Global South more broadly. And the argument that I want to present today is as follows. Mega infrastructures indeed entrench and rework ongoing colonial re relations of racial domination, inequality, and difference. However, to understand these relations, we need to think beyond analytical categories and lived experiences of race that critical scholarship in general and geographical scholarship in particular has focused on. In instead, I want to suggest that to understand a deeply colonial power of contemporary mega infrastructures in shaping everyday life, we can do this uh, through a focus on ethnicity, et ethnic politics, and ethnicity being an enduring colonial drama of self. I know I'm aware that this is a conceptually loaded argument, and I'm introducing a few quite specific terms that probably not all of you are familiar with, but please bear with me, I'll use the next 40 minutes or so to explain this in further detail. So to develop this argument on how mega infrastructure development sustains colonial relations of power in an ostensibly post-colonial moment, my presentation is divided into three parts. First, I will discuss the question of race and coloniality that has reemerged again in popular discourse, critical scholarship more broadly, and geographical research in particular. Second, I will outline some of the trends of mega infrastructure development in coastal Kenya. That's where I've been working for the last three years. And third, I will reflect and provide my contribution to the literature, argue, showing how these trends of infrastructure development intersect in active ways with ongoing dynamics of coloniality. Okay, so I'm perhaps bordering the risk of stating something obvious that in the last 10 years, the question of race and racialism has prominently re-entered the public discourse. We increasingly see and discuss how contemporary politics, events, and governance practices continue to be shaped by racialism. Namely, a belief that groups of humans possess different behavioral traits corresponding to inherent attributes and thus can be divided into different groups of superiority based on one race over another. Examples of how the idea of race and resultant practices of racialism continue to determine uneven possibilities of a livable life are numerous. This would include Black Lives Matter movement in the US that has highlighted and challenged police brutality and state violence experienced primarily by black people. The question of race and racially motivated different treatment of people is also very close to where we are in Europe. For instance, in recent years, we have seen different treatment of war refugees, primarily based on their skin color and where they come from. This becomes very apparent when we see how mainstream media portrays white Ukrainian refugees as people fleeing war. Whilst at the same time, populations of color are de dehumanized. That is, instead of being portrayed equally as people fleeing conflict or extreme poverty, they are called migrants attempting to reach Europe. 
Unfortunately, there's nothing new or surprising about this racial dynamic in the ongoing differentiation between lives worth saving and lives expendable and disposable. Critical scholarship since the 1980s has convincingly demonstrated that deliberate differentiation of peoples based on the idea of race has in fact been integral to capitalist development. As Cedric Robinson argued, a system of capitalism is first and foremost a system of racial capitalism. This is because as a system of exploitation, expropriation and expatriation, it is based on imperialism, slavery and genocide. And all of this was only possible and continues to be possible because of a systemic exaggeration of regional, subcultural and dialectic differences into racial others. So one of the key takeaway points here is that there's nothing natural or ontologically fixed about race. In other words, the very idea of race is fiction that capitalist system needs to justify the systematic exploitation of people for surplus value production. As a radical feminist, black feminist tradition foregrounded, race is not a biological or cultural classification, but it is instead a set of socio-political processes of differentiation, which are then projected onto the putatively biological human body. This fiction that creates differences is central to capital, for capitalism can only accumulate by producing and moving through relations of severe inequality amongst different, different human groups. And therefore, for capitalism to survive, it must exploit and prey upon the, this unequal differentiation of human value. Of this is, of course, one of the greatest tragedies of human history. The transatlantic slave trade that for over 400 years transported over 15 million men, women, and children to work on cotton or sugar plantations, for instance. This organized form of slavery was the engine that propelled Europe's rise to global economic dominance. This was, of course, a part of a European project of modernity and imperialism That's, that was fundamentally based on the idea of white superiority. This justified capture, slavery, colonization, and murder of people who were deemed to be racially different and other, and thus inferior to this concept and superiority of whiteness. So highlighting these dynamics and reflecting on ongoing colonial histories of empire, critical scholarship has shown how as a system of op op oppression, colonialism, and racial capitalism never ceased to exist, but was rebranded. In other words, while European imperialism formally ended in the 1960s, and slavery in fact formally ended in 1865, the power structures that were set in motion through the expansion of European empires continue to shape social, and material relations of today's world. As Kijano argued, the coloniality of power reverberates into the present, and it continues to reinscribe this socio-political construct of race as a fundamental criterion of social, economic, political, cultural relations, as well as classifications of peoples. Whilst this critique started in radical scholarship, this kind of observation is no longer radical because we see these arguments being made in popular television, for example, as I guess many of you will know, this caricature that we base how we evaluate people, for instance, the migrants who come to Europe, or war refugees rather, is primarily based on Europe, or on their the skin color. So this, this critique that started as a radical critique, in fact, is becoming more and more prominent. And this form of enduring racism 
enables an ongoing expansion and intensification of racial capitalism, as well as sustains unjust and fundamentally unequal global division of labor that subordinates racialized peoples to exploitation, heightened precarity, and premature death. Again, we see another headline from, from popular uh, uh, mainstream sources that very openly co compare current conditions of labor to colonial times. So these conversations about coloniality have also been recently advanced in critical geographical scholarship on infrastructure and the types of power relations that mega infrastructures reiterate across different scales. As an increasing number of scholars, you included and myself, we highlight how infrastructure systems are deeply rooted in colonial histories of empire and how in this way they rework, although in contingent ways, the ongoing relations of coloniality. In other words, rather than being new, the current mega infra infrastructures reproduce colonial spatial visions and plans of connecting national territories or formerly colonized spaces to further integrate these landscapes into global racialized systems of exploitation, plunder, and violence that capitalist accumulation needs. For instance, in the context of Kenya, Bangui Kimari and Her Her Henrik en Ernston have highlighted that there's a very clear racial dynamic to how contemporary mega infrastructures are constructed. Namely, they argue that today mega infrastructures engage and extend already existing dynamics of pathological racialization of African Africans, even amidst claims of horizontal South South development cooperation or win win uh, development scenarios. In other words, just as during the colonial period when Africans were racialized and, and deemed as lacking recent progress and civilization, they are yet again deemed to be lacking knowledge and development. This, this time, it's not British. For instance, that the Chinese state capital, those expansion is justified through the lack of development on the African continent. And once again, Kimari and Anson argue that there's nothing new about this, but it's just an ongoing dynamic of coloniality that subjects racialized, formerly racially subjugated, colonized African populations to an idea of what constitutes or doesn't development. The list of symbolic frameworks that are continually evolved to justify and advance changing forms of colonialism and racialization disguised as development is very long. As a Puerto Rican sociologist, Ramon Grofasquel observed, we went from the 16th century characterization of people without writing to the 18th and 19th century characterization of people without history to the 20th century characterization of people without development and more recently to the early 21st century of people without democracy. I would add that if Prof. Scale was in fact writing in the present moment, he would perhaps add people without infrastructure to this list of what racialized populations are constantly lacking. What is my intervention then that I want to make in the context of this recent literature of contemporary mega infrastructures and how they actively rework global histories of capitalism, empire, and race? Whilst I find this critical scholarship key in understanding the politics of mega infrastructures in Kenya and beyond, I want to argue that the question of race and coloniality only explains the structural dynamic of different regimes of racialization. So for instance, relations between whiteness and blackness as two set of different historical experiences of being in the world and of the world. It explains how these systems are now changing through the expansion of Chinese state capitalism and how this again reiterates a deeply racialized understanding of African population and countries as underdeveloped. To me, the analytical focus on race does not exactly ex explain how mega infrastructures are experienced and lived in the spaces where they are constructed. 
and what further differentiation of racialized populations occurs on the ground. Let me explain what sort of different dynamics of coloniality and further differentiation of racialized populations I highlight in my most recent work. So those who are familiar with my work will know that I have published quite a, a bit on the questions of everyday life, politics, and contemporary mega infrastructures in Kenya. In this work, I'm particularly interested in the everydayness of mega projects, specifically how their construction and functioning and the processes of contestation, dispossession, and conflict that degenerate. For me, what's interesting is how these processes are experienced by vulnerable and historically marginalized groups of people. For instance, with Jessica, I've worked on the politi politics of the Standard Gauge Railway, which was built by the Chinese actors, on the actual ruins of the former colonial Uganda Railway built by the British. Most recently, I've been working on the construction of Lamu Port as a part of the larger Lamu Port, South Sudan, Ethiopia transport corridor that is meant to connect these three countries. Expressing the logics of regional integration, Lapset is central to Kenya's National Development Vision 2030, which Jessica already mentioned. And this development program, national development program, is aimed at transforming Kenya into a, an industrialized country, overcome its aid dependencies, and achieve a middle income status in less than two decades. For instance, on the 2nd of March in 2012, at the opening ceremony of Lapset, Kenyan President Mubai Kibaki stated, I have no doubt that this, will day, that this day will go down in history as one of the defining moments when we made a major stride to connect our people to the many socio-economic opportunities that lie ahead. However, as many of us will know, today the anticipated benefits of, of Lapset only operate symbolically. The actual material effects of and so-called expected development that would realize the state promised modernity are yet to be seen and experienced. In fact, across Kenya, national projects, national mega projects have been shown to limit access to land and other natural, natural resources mostly for marginalized populations, which trigger social conflict. I think most of us in the audience are familiar with these dynamics, and I don't need to discuss them in detail. In Lamu, with the port construction already underway, the development of Lapset has similarly escalated competition over land, simultaneously trigger triggering conflicts over meanings of identity, belonging, and development. This has led to civil society mobilization to save Lamu. Rather than reflecting on these kind of social uh, civil society group mobilization, I want to bring this, these dynamics back to my discussion on racial capitalism and infrastructure. An interesting question to ask, well, at least to me, is how do relations of coloniality and ra ra racialization feature here in the context of Lamu Port? Do they feature at all, or are these dynamics somehow not present? The short answer is that yes, they do, and in a very prominent way, but this cannot necessarily be explained through the dynamics and experiences of race that critical scholarship has focused in its analysis of infrastructure and its colonial power. At this point, I have completed over 12 months of on-the-ground research in Kenya and having engaged with people who are directly affected by mega infrastructures, I have never heard anyone describe themselves as black, as being a specific type of race that is disadvantaged by global colonial relations of power. Whilst people, people use categories like Chinese, British, white, the main framework that they use to describe themselves and how they experience the impacts of infrastructure in Kenya are terms like Kikuyu, Bajuni, Maasai, or Swahili. In other words, rather than focusing on blackness, they focus on their ethnicity as a main identity and a social frame that they have to make sense of their contingent place in the world of not their own making. <laughs> 
in my reading of everyday politics of infrastructure in Kenya, this sustained focus on ethnicity is a crucial moment to reflect on how former colonial mechanisms of racial differentiation and control continue to function in, a, in an ostensibly post-colonial moment and present. Therefore, what I want to suggest in this paper is that to understand everyday politics of infrastructure and how they intersect with global colonial histories of empire and colonialism, we need to further dif differentiate the experience and analytical frame of race. I want to highlight that the concept of racial capitalism and race, whilst having an invaluable analytical purchase in understanding relations of difference, inequality, and domination and violence, they need to be further dif differentiated through specific time and space-based experiences of inequality, difference, and struggle. Let me explain this through a specific example of infrastructure, conflict, and ethnicity in Lamu. So the impacts of Lamu, Port, and Lapset, including land conflict, conflict over governance of natural resources, dispossession, and other typical impacts of large-scale infrastructures, in Lamu, they are primarily understood and narrated through ethnic identity politics. Specifically, a very prominent binary between those who are considered indigenous and those who are considered guests in the region. This is expressed in the following way. That local Lamu populations, such as Swahili or Bajuni, are being deliberately disadvantaged by the central Kenyan state that historically has been controlled by the Kikuyu ethnic group, which is one of the largest and most politically powerful ethnic groupings in Kenya. In local narratives, this tension is narrated in the following way. We, the people of Lamu, are only 120,000 people in the 54 million people of Kenya. We will not be able to defend our culture and values when all those newcomers arrive. It's one tribe against another tribe. That's how politics are done in Kenya. We will be outnumbered by Kikuyus. We will become guests in our own land, strangers in our own home. These experiences of marginalization are, of course, grounded in longer histories of power struggles and ethnic group conflict in the country. For instance, since the early post-independence period, the central government controlled by Kikuyu group actively supported the relocation and resettlement schemes of Kikuyu groups from the central highlands of Kenya, and it supported them to come and settle in Lamu. Meanwhile, it provided no similar assistance whatsoever to local populations of Swahili or Bajuni ethnic groups. And this, of course, created an ongoing opposition between Kikuyus as the president supported newcomers to Lamu, on the one hand, and the indigenous populations of Lamu who are deliberately being neglected by the Kikuyu-dominated government, on the other. This continues to be a primary way of making sense of everyday hardships in Lamu. For instance, as one Bajuni community leader observed, before Kenya was independent, Lamu was a good place, but now it has declined. All of this is due to Kenya's independence and all and the influence of Kikuyus everywhere. Kikuyus are dominating our culture and our lives. The government has always tried to erase us and ignore all the injustice done to us, the people of Lamu. So in this sense, as you can see, the current struggles and ethnic conflicts triggered by mega infrastructure development rework these longer historical layers of state neglect, marginalization, and social effacement. Just to show another quote that illustrates this dynamic very clearly, one of the people in, in Lamu observed, Lamu court will be good for Kenya, but not for the people of Lamu. All jobs will go to Kikuyus. Every, everybody working in the port comes from somewhere else, but not Lamu. It has always been like this. All the jobs at the Kenyan port are taken by the Kikuyu people. It's one tribe against another. So as we see, these different manifestations of injustice are interpreted through constructs of socio-political differentiation, such as ethnicity and tribe. Through these frames, the people of Lamu make sense of state-led changes in their living environments 
as well as a aim to make a claim and sustain a place in the world of not their own making. An interesting question, again, at least to me, is how these dynamics of ethnicity politics and mega infrastructure development are intertwined with global colonial histories of empire and racialism that I had started, uh, that I had discussed at the start of my talk. In other words, what is the interconnection between what is happening now in Lamu and global inherently colonial histories of racialism? As I already indicated, to answer this question, we need to focus on the very framework of ethnicity and how it came into being as colonial drama to further differentiate and divide and control racialized populations. <coughs> so Lamo is not by any chance unique in Kenya's context. Kenya's politics is largely, has largely been structured and dominated by eth ethnicity and ethnic conflict. We can perhaps discuss this uh, in the questions if you are interested. And this is one of the key books in understanding this dynamic, <coughs> how ethnicity keeps to dominate uh, social, civic, and political engagement in Kenya. However, in spite of this centrality of ethnicity in Kenya's life, this does not reflect autonomous in some way primordial identities and social practices of different peoples. Instead, the construction of ostensi ostensibly clear ethnic boundaries is actually an active legacy of European colonialism that continues to shape social and political orders and forms of knowledge and meaning making in the post, post colony. Differently put, as both of these books make this argument, the frameworks of ethnicity as identity are direct effects of colonial relations that continue to shape dominant social dramas of belonging. Let me explain how, during the colonial period, ethnic categorization of people was central to the colonial practices of control. These practices of control primarily relied upon the construct of ethnicity to symbolically enforce the primitive nature of Africans who, as colonial, colonialists argued, would be given salvation through their exposure to European civilization. In this sense, the very idea of tribal Africa was a European imaginary that defined the lack of humanity and reason of racialized populations. Elitha, for instance, highlighted how, as European colonial powers classified social life into different categories, focusing on race and tribe, it, in some instances, these processes of categorization resulted in completely fictitious inventions of ethnicity as a specific ethnic group. And here, anthropology as a discipline had a very specific role to play. It was British, French, anthropologists who went to Africa to understand and classify people into different categories. So in these contexts of colonial intervention in Africa, the construction of ethnicity functioned as an instrument of dehumanization, or as Sylvia Winter called this a subgenre of being human. In other words, during the colonial period, those deemed to be of a specific tribe were perceived as less human, as inferior to white colonizers. These processes also took a material form. It wasn't just symbolic. This was particularly visible in relation to land expropriation for the development of the settler colony in Kenya. The Crown, ordinan the Crown Lands Ordinance of 1915, for instance, introduced a dual system of land administration that divided land into native reserves and wide highlands for European settlement. Each of these reserves, in turn, was allocated for the use of a specific ethnic group. So what this did, this in effect materialized the symbolic construct of ethnicity and placing it within the colon colony's landscape. And for colonial power, this was very productive because it obstructed interactions and potential political mobilizations between different groups who were deemed to be ethnically different. So in other words, it was a very straightforward divide and con conquer tactic. <coughs> 
However, of course, it is important to mention that these practices of control could not give exact content to these new categories of belonging and these new forms of expression of identity. Instead, these frameworks of meaning making were, were much more complex and contested modalities of power, identity, and belonging than the colonial state had the capacity to control. Therefore, ethnicity as a form of identity, it only took for, full form and emerged out of multiple power struggles within African societies themselves. Therefore, even if ethnic group, ethnic group based identities and social alliances ossified during the colonial period, we cannot say that ethnicity as identity became rigid during that period. Instead, it transformed the social, political, and economic relations and circumstances. So here, it is not my aim to qualify whether contemporary boundaries of ethnicity were indeed fictitiously invented during the colonial period, nor do I want to answer whether European colonization was only one disruptive moment within a much longer history of changing ethnic group formations and multiple power alliances. Instead, these deeply historical and anthropological questions are better explained elsewhere. What I do, however, want to highlight is that we, what these debates, these historical and anthropological debates leave implicit, namely that the very idea, the very concept of ethnicity, of ethnic identity, it only emerged during the colonial period. So it was a product of an effect of colonial differentiation of life against the idea of whiteness as progress and modernity. And here we see this, pic this picture illustrates this dynamic so well, where we, where we see how a middle, upper middle class white European woman is juxtaposed to these ethnically eth ethnicized women who are in their clothing. And we see like she's sitting, putting a makeup on, whilst these racialized women are portrayed in a rather different kind of way, right? And if we go this, like this could only happen, these kind of pictures and these kind of ju ju juxtapositions between whiteness and racialized populations could only happen because this idea of whiteness was based on the supposed irrationality of its black non-human other. And this idea, these practices of imagination and symboliza symbolization brought the very idea and concept of ethnicity as, as a distinct form of identity in the world. As we see through, through my examples of Lamu that I demonstrated earlier in the context of my research, people in Kenya still live with this construct today, even if they have reiterated and embodied ethnicity in multiple ways that colonial power could not control from the beginning. Highlighting this, my argument is that when we discuss coloniality and how it is reworked through infrastructure, we need to highlight how ethnic tensions created by infrastructure development actually connect with these longer histories of empire, coloniality, and racialism. Why is this important, my, one, might, one might ask? This shows that particularities of specific cultural and ethnic groupings, however meaningful, they might, they might appear to individual groups and individuals who choose to narrate their lives through these identity categories. We see that these identity forms are, in fact, effects of colonialism. As Vehelaya notes, they are in danger of entering the discursive record as transcendental truths rather than being seen as structures and institutions that had served repeatedly to relegate black subjects to the status of Western modernity's non-human other. This is exactly what colonial practice of, of ethnicity did. They constructed the idea of ethnicity and tribe to differentiate and separate natives from the European civilization so they could do this. It's exactly why it, it happened. This was meant to inscribe that colonized populations were other, less rational, and not capable of self-governance, like white colonizers. 
Importantly, because in the present moment, racialized peoples rework and adapt these colonial forms of valuing lives, as their own lives as well as those of others, they inevitably reproduce the coloniality of power and what happened during colonialism. As Coulthard argues, dominant groups tend to entrench their hegemony by incalculating an image of inferiority in the subjugated. In this sense, the colonized subject is not the subject who is exposed to colonial violence. Instead, it is the subject who internalizes this violence as one's ontological truth. In other words, the colonized subject accepts its inferiority to the idea of whiteness. In this sense, real emancipatory politics can only emerge from thinking beyond identity categories that were given through colonial practices of power. As Shil Mbembe, for instance, argues, a crucial point is to abandon identity and social differentiation given through colonization. This is particularly salient in formulating strategies of decolonization and what it means to be human in today's post-colonial moment. We see these strategies of em emancipation in Kenya as well, where slowly growing social movements are making the point to abandon eth ethnic forms of identification in Kenya altogether. The political project here is to let go of these arbitrary divisions of people that structure Kenya's social, political, and economic life. In many ways, however, this remains a utopia as Kenya's lives continues to, continues to be structured by ethnic group affiliation. For instance, in voting patterns, people primarily vote on their ethnic group allegiance. And this can lead to tragic consequences, for instance, as the post-2008 election violence that escalated due to ethnic divisions and manipulation of these ethnic divisions by politicians wanting to contest the election results. This led to nearly 1,500 deaths and more than half a million of displaced people. In this way, we see how colonial dramas of identity that are still active today and how they can contribute to violence, murder, and displacement. As I showed earlier, this tension, although luckily less violent, is equally iterated through mega-infrastructure development and conflict that it generates as well. The future of the post-colony, therefore, I argue in my paper, is burdened by these enduring colonial injuries of the past. It is through the acknowledgement of these dynamics of ethnicity as further differentiation of blackness and race that we can understand how global histories of coloniality and empire are being reworked through current development processes, such as mega infrastructure development. What I aim to show today is that mega infrastructures indeed entrench and rework ongoing relations of colonization, racialization, and domination, as critical scholarship has highlighted. However, at least in the context of my research, to understand these relations, we need to think further beyond categories and experiences of race that critical scholarship has highlighted. To further nuance and advance this analysis, I suggest that the deeply colonial power of infrastructure and how it shapes everyday life can be understood through everyday politics of ethnicity, ethnicity being an enduring colonial gram of self. If you are interested in this argument and more elaborate, detailed elaborate, elaboration, of a line of these arguments, I invite you to read my paper that should be out in a couple of weeks. I just submitted proofs last week. So it will be an antipode. And uh, thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to questions. And please get in touch if you want to discuss any of these dynamics in the future.